Welcome everybody to our workshop on learning with your personal AI tutor, who is, or that is, slightly delusional. So we're going to be talking today about generative AI and the use of generative AI uh, to uh, to be used as your personal tutor. And and I'll actually start with a uh, with a with a, a brief story, uh, uh, actually something that happened to me just about an hour and a half ago. So I teach a class on transformers. Transformers are the underlying technology which, which drive generative AI. And one of the challenges is, uh, and one of the joys is that we have uh, people from all different areas that come and take this graduate level course. So yes, we have data science master students, we have CS PhD students, we have, uh, but we also have, have folks that are in the humanities. We, we have folks that are in, in music, we have from all over the university. And, and, and the challenge for the folks who are not STEM is that for part of the course, they need to understand some linear algebra. It's, it's more about how the, the models are represented. And so you can read a, a particular paper that I have that I'll be showing you a little bit more about in just a little bit, as a matter of fact. Um, but, it's, it, but it's hard. Uh, so for folks that, uh, for folks that, uh, uh, are not used to this. It's a very different, uh, very different look. So, uh, what we uh, what we do is we read a paper. And previously, what I did was I had help sessions where I would have almost uh, half the class be there for the help session, so I could talk through and explain uh, what all of this meant, uh, what the tech, what the notation meant. But that didn't happen this year. I'd, I'd, I'd started out and I'd said, you know, be sure to use generative AI to ask questions about generative AI. So upload uh, the PDF of the paper we're going to be talking about and ask questions and interact with it and use that to, to buttress your understanding. Well, I asked the class, you know, are you all interested in, in, in having a session on, on linear algebra? And to a person, they said, well, actually, we understand. We're, we're able to ask all the questions that we wanted to using ChatGPT. It took us through. It gave us really good examples. And so now we understand what we need to understand of linear algebra. So, yeah, we don't, we don't need to have that special session anymore. We understand now. And for me, that was remarkably powerful. So here we have students, some of whom have no background in this. And yet... Through the use of generative AI, ChatGPT, and other models like that, they were able to take a very complex paper and work through the notation, ask the questions as they wished, and ask it to be explained in a different way. Give me an analogy. Explain to me, given my background, given what I know, explain to this, explain this complex uh, uh, concept in a way that I can understand. And it worked. I asked questions in class, even tough questions. They're on it. And it matters not so much anymore what background they had before they came in. ChatGPT gives them the framework, the, the conceptual framework on which to build if you ask the right questions. It, it gives them the opportunity to ask questions, to test their knowledge, and to build what they need to have. And so then we can actually do what we want to do in the class, which is understand how transformers work. So the idea here today is to share with you some of the uh, best practice approaches to uh, suggesting this for your use and for the use of your students. Uh, Dr. Charo Bell, who is also with us, is going to be talking about uh, some technology that we developed over the summer uh, for instructors and for faculty uh, to use uh, in, in your classrooms uh, and also for use by students as well to support self-study. But we have to cover some caveats first. You notice that uh, in the slide here, I do have this asterisk here. And as we know, asterisks are very important, whether it uh, is a title of a paper or whether it's a, your, 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 your batting score for, for sports. It's slightly delusional. So what do we mean by that? Um, so let's take a look at a simplified transformer. This is, this is essentially what's going on 
uh, in the background with when you interact with chat GPT. What happens is you put in some context, you put in a prompt, you ask for something, you describe something, and you want it to come up with a response. Technically, what's happening is what the model is doing is producing uh, the next uh, word in the context. So you give it something and it predicts the next word and the next and the next and the next. Oh, you don't see the slides. Thank you so much for letting me know so quickly that you don't see the slides. Let me go ahead and... All right. Does everyone see the slides now? Okay, good. All right, so really what's happening is that the model is producing the next word, the next word, and the next word. And in actuality, what it's doing, it's predicting the no next most probable token, word or subword, given the context that came before. And the model's been well trained. So if you're asking a question, it knows that the next most probable token or word is going to be the, the beginning of the answer to the question that you've posed. But note that it, it is all probabilities. So one way to think about this is it's returning what's plausible. So what's probable? This does not mean that it's doing a lookup. As a matter of fact, it can't do a lookup. If you take a look at the architecture here, so uh, I'm not going to go through all this, but you're, we have other workshops where we do. But it's it's taking the words, turning them into numbers, and then and where this is the decoder stack, this is where it disentangles and where it re-represents what you've given it, and then re-represents it as the next token. So it makes the prediction of the next word. This is not a lookup. This is not a database here. This is association. This is this is memory, kind of like how we have memory. It turns out humans are terrible at getting sources right. Uh, we don't know where we learned things. Uh, we only get things approximately right. Same thing is true here. You can think of this as being a fuzzy JPEG of the internet. It doesn't have exactly the information, but it knows the relationships. It represents the relationships and, and can find uh, probable responses given whatever you give it. But it doesn't, in its purest form, have the ability to do a lookup and to give you exactly that lookup. So instead, it's giving you a probable answer. And this is why I say slightly delusional. So that means if you do not give the model enough context, you may get a probable answer that's not the one that you want. If you give the model some context and you're asking for very specific information, and my favorite of this is if you're asking if in this context, you ask for citations, you ask for particular papers, you treat it like Google, it will absolutely produce probable citations. Are these real citations? Do these exist in the real world? Almost certainly not. Remember, it's a fuzzy JPEG, but it's going to give you something which is probable. And, and the, the funny thing is this usually gets people very excited because the papers are very, very similar to what was asked for. So in the context, you describe exactly what you want the, the papers to be. Find me citations that do the following. And it gives you responses that sound beautiful. The titles are just exactly what you asked for. The authors are maybe even authors that publish in your area. But then you might notice some things are a little bit off, like the middle initials are wrong. The, the dates are wrong. You know they didn't publish in this. And when you go and you look it up, you realize they didn't write those papers. It's possible a paper was written with a similar title, but it's doing what it's trained to do, which is come up with probable responses. So using this as Google will absolutely fail. Now you can, you can use it, uh, it's called augmented. So you can use certain types of, of models like Bing GPT, Bing Chat. That is the ability to do a lookup. And what it's doing there is you ask it a question Google-like, it realizes you asked a Google-like question, so it does its own internet search using Bing, puts that answer in the prompt, and then answers you. And it does a better job. But again, still not perfect. So then the question arises, why even use this? It's a terrible Google. Well, the answer is we don't use it as Google. Instead, we use it 
to do what it's best at, which is to find associations, make analogies, find connections, do rephrasing, explain step by step based on your background, based on chain of thought reasoning. So it's able to come up with responses that are tailored to you if you describe who you are. It can explain using as many different analogies as you want. Uh, with or without any particular assumptions that you want. And it's good at explaining, even if it's not good at the particular facts. So the question arises, how do you keep it more factual? I mentioned before internet search, but it turns out this is not great. Remember, it's doing an internet search. If it finds a terrible resource, it's going to spit that right back to you. So let's actually go through some examples, some real world examples of how to best use these models and some extra tools that you may not know about that can turn out to be extremely useful. Uh, so you can actually keep it more factual, make it more useful, allow it to do things that couldn't do on its own. So we're gonna learn how to augment these models. And we're also gonna learn how to use it to check your knowledge and your understanding. We're gonna go through some examples of that. And then Dr. Bell is gonna go through a tool that we've built on top of uh, uh, these large language models uh, and uh, uh, show you how we can even make it simpler for you and for your students uh, to get to the answers that you need. Before we dive into the examples, are there questions that anyone has about the models or about anything that we've talked about to this point? And you can put this into the chat or you can simply unmute yourself and ask. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious what is meant by hidden states in yeah. this uh, slide. Absolutely. So hidden states, what happens is words go in, they get represented as numbers in here, they get re-represented. And I'm just going to lay it out there, but happy to answer questions at the end as, as well. They get re-represented as embeddings in a high dimensional semantic space. All right. So what does that mean? That just means you can take a word, it gets re-represented more conceptually. And so it's placed into a location and that location has meaning. So the uh, the classic example from early embedding work is king. King exists in this location. Um, if I subtract man from king, I'll end up in another place in the space. Any guesses from anyone what man minus king might mean? What word might be near that? I know a lot of people think queen, but I didn't add woman. I like said, oh, serf, peasant. Mm, we still have the kingliness. I th I thought that you were subtracting king. Oh, from... oh no, I took, I took, oh, good point. Direction matters, right? I took man and I subtract, I'm sorry, I took king and I subtract man. Then I would guess crab. Okay. Could. Because there's king oh. crab. Oh, I love it. So king is in ruler. Let's say we've given enough context. And so it's king is in ruler minus man. Then we might have like regent, ruler, something along those lines, right? That's not gendered. Now, what if we took this regent or this area here and we added the vector to woman? Now, Maureen, we have queen, right? Here's king, here's queen, here's regent. So it's a semantic space where locations have meaning and you can do math. So the hidden states are quite literally, what is the location of what you put in? And so your statement that you put in has a meaning and it has a location. You can use that either to do the next bit here where you are predicting the next word, or you can use these hidden states directly. They're very useful. You can imagine doing clustering. You can imagine doing so, so sort of kind of cool to be able to do math on semantics, right? So they're both useful. When we do generative AI, what we're asking it to do is predict the next word, communicate with us in natural language. Great question, Noah. Other questions? All right. Then let me share with you uh, 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 some work that I was doing just a little bit uh, a little bit earlier. So. Let's say, I'm going to start, I start a new chat here, and, and let's say that um, so I have a child, Larson, and uh, they were taking calculus for the first time, 
And uh, they were calling me up because I do no calculus, but uh, I was saying, you know, there's a better way to do this if you want to. You know, you can you can check in at any time. You can get as many examples as you want. Try Chat GPT, but but do the following: Chat GPT all by itself. Let's do the older version. Let's see what we get here. I'm going to ask the older version, and this is the version that you get with if you don't have the paid. Chat Plus is only twenty dollars a month. Best twenty dollars you'll spend. Um, so I'm going to say, what uh, is the derivative? of x, let's say, raised to the power of 3 minus 2x uh, uh, raised to the power of 0.5 minus 1. And so it goes through, and it thinks, oh, lovely. So it gives me a nice, oh, it's actually doing a really good job. I expect it to do much worse than this. So it represents, so this is this is great. So it's been trained on some of the math and this is actually not bad at all, but let's see what happens when I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start another chat here and now I'm gonna go to GPT-4, which is a more powerful one, but I'm also going to turn on a plugin. So I'm going to turn on a plugin, and what I'm going to turn on is I'm going to turn on Wolfram. Yay! So, yes, Wolfram, it's fantastic. I, I used to live right down the street from Wolfram, as a matter of fact. So what is a plugin? Well, remember before when I was showing you this, and I said Bing had the capability of asking for a search. The same thing happens here. GPT-4 has been trained to use tools and it knows when it asks, it's asked something where it really should ask Wolfram for some more information. So let's watch what happens when I give the same question, but to an augmented GPT-4. So GPT-4 now has the ability to ask Wolfram for some help. So remember the question that I asked before was, what is the derivative of this thing? I'm going to do a new chat, GPT-4, and I'm going to ask it to be sure to use Wolfram. That's Wolfram right there. <clears throat> so now I've asked GPT-4. It's going to take a moment to generate. Look, and it knew that it used, it, need, it knew that it needed to look up Wolfram. So it's sending the query to Wolfram, and it's going to combine everything together. Notice that it's it's showing, it's, it's writing it in a nice uh, output. Oh, and it's showing me a plot of the derivative. Oh, it's giving me the alternate form, the real root, the complex root, the domain. This is everything I need to know. And how was it able to do that? Not because GPT-4 knew, knew all this, but it was augmented. So what's the lesson here? If you want to learn something, especially math, science-related, STEM-related, if you have Chat Plus and if you turn on Wolfram, you're very likely to get an augmented answer that includes much more information than you'll get from ChatGPT or from GPT-4 alone. It's more likely to be correct. And it's more likely to be correct because of what it's doing. It's doing the prompt. It finds it doesn't really have all the information it needs. It sends it out to a tool, in this case, the Wolfram tool. Wolfram tool puts that information back into the prompt it's far more likely to return something that is exactly in its prompt than try to just figure it out or pull it from its own fuzzy memory. And so it's able to re-represent and give you a much more factual, accurate, uh, and more complete answer. So that's a great way to use, and there are all sorts of plugins. So uh, for the plugins, you can go to, um, I'll have to start another chat, but there's uh, very nice plugins for languages uh, called Speak. Uh, there's Scholar AI. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of these that you can choose from, uh, and they each have their specialty. So if you're trying to learn a language, hey, try Speak, uh, and that will give you uh, a lot of additional information. So what are questions you might have about using an augmented model, augmented by tools, uh, to, to answer questions and to be a tutor for you? All right. 
Then let's talk about another way uh, that you can um, uh, use these models. Remember I said uh, that part of what's important is that your prompt has enough context. It's long enough. And so it can answer the question. So one way to use these is to give it a lot of context. If you have a question about a paragraph, you could copy and paste that paragraph and then ask about the particular part that you had, or maybe the paragraph that came before. The more that you put in, the better off you're going to be. There are some limitations. For GPT-4, you have a context length of about 8,000 tokens. Um, what are tokens? And you might remember that from the graph that we had before. It actually uses tokens, not words. To you, you Sometimes you can get one word uh, out of a token. A token may represent one word. Often, though, you'll need two or more tokens to represent a word. So you get, you know, so 8,000, maybe about 6,000 words, 4,000 words, depending. Um, so that's about how much room you have before the model starts forgetting. Everything needs to fit in the context. Your original question, the response, the response that you had to response, that all needs to fit in the context because otherwise it starts forgetting what you've been talking about. And you'll find that sometimes where it just like loses its way. It's like, don't you remember what we we're talking about? No, it does not because that is a fixed context length. So GPT 3.5, GPT 4 is really good up to a certain point. But let's say that you have a PDF because often we want to like we give our students or our students who are here, we, we want to learn off of a paper that we have, right? So there are a couple of ways of getting that paper in, but you've got to fit it within this length. So let me show you another tool. And we're going to have a whole workshop on this. So I'm not going to go into it too much, but, uh, but there is uh an amazing tool that you can have if you have Chat Plus, uh, which is called Advanced Data Analytics. So uh, I think this was poorly named, but it's renamed from Code Interpreter, which was also poorly named. So let me tell you what it is. This is a super tool. So Advanced Data Analytics is a super tool. It allows the model uh, a compute. So the model is how to write code. The model is how to write lots of different computer languages. It knows how to write Python. So if you ask it a question that is better solved with a computer program than with it trying to reason through it, it will write a computer program to answer your question. That's called advanced data analytics because often what people do is they'll upload data and again, we'll be talking about this. There are great applications of this for science research and for humanities and for all different fields. We'll have all other workshops on this. But you can upload your data. It'll write a program, help you answer questions about the data. But the other thing that it can do is it can write a program to solve whatever. It doesn't have to be about data analysis. So let's say that I have a paper. And uh, in this case here, I'm going I'm to show you what the paper is. Um, oh, I know which paper I'm going to do. Uh, prompt uh, engineering. So this is a paper uh, uh, written by uh, some colleagues and, and myself. I, my, my contribution pales into comparison to the, to the work that, uh, that these other folks did on this paper. This really nice paper on prompt engineering. We had a session of, on this and we have it on our YouTube video. Uh, and uh, colleague Jules White has a full uh, Coursera course on this. Uh, based on this paper, prompt pattern catalog to enhance prompt engineering. So let's say that I want to learn about this paper. So what I can do is I can download this paper. And now the paper is going to be in my downloads folder. It's going to be showing up in just a minute. Uh, uh, let's see. Should be my downloads paper. Oh, OK. Yes. So I have to save it. All right, so now it's saved there. So now ChatGPT, I can upload a paper to ChatGPT. Because I'm because I have Ada turned on, I can upload now. And all I have to do is select one I want to upload. This is the paper. I'm going to upload it. Now the tricky thing is 
is 8,000 tokens enough? If it's a long paper, it's not going to be enough. So I've uploaded, I'm going to say, you know, please summarize this paper. So I've uploaded, it says, oh, it realizes it needs to load it. And so if we peek inside to see what it's writing for itself, it's light, it's, it's, it's loading up a PDF loader. It's writing code so it can load the PDF itself. Finished working. The paper appears to be titled and is authored by these people. Would you like a detailed summary of the paper? Given your role, I told it who I was earlier. Given your role at Vanderbilt University Data Science Institute, this could be directly relevant to your work. You think? Could be. So yes, please do. And then it's going through and it's trying to pull out information. It's doing a summary. Now, keep in mind, this is a PDF, but you could also upload a PowerPoint. It can load PowerPoints. Um, and you can question, do questions and answer. Ah, the summary got truncated. So we ran into a problem here where it was not able to load everything. Sometimes you can load full papers into chat GPT. Sometimes you can't. But here the summary is not too bad. So now here's the interesting thing. You can ask it questions about the paper. It's been truncated, so I know it's gonna be a little bit more limited. So I'm gonna show you another way that you can have a generative AI ask questions. But if you have a shorter paper, or if you wanna cut and paste information here, that's a great way to interact and to ask questions and to learn off of a document. Now, sometimes you can learn off of just the model itself. If it's very well-known general knowledge, then you could certainly learn off the model itself, but it's safer to put things into context. But let's see what happens if we just ask it things directly. So we could say, uh, in what year, the, I'm asking it like Google, right? So this is risky, uh, was you know uh, Marcus uh, Aurelius elevated to emperor uh, in the Roman empire? Very broad common knowledge, it's more likely to get correct. Um, but you have to be skeptical if you do this. So I suggest that people be skeptical consumers if you're doing this. And, and even if it's in the context, you want to just be sure and to uh, and to make sure that uh, uh, that, that you have a uh, a good handle around this because the more and more fine grained you get, the less and less of a good job the model is going to be able to do. So a safer way to do this is to copy and paste maybe a chapter on the Roman Empire. That's a safer thing to do. But let's say I want that PDF in there. So another model, which is also a generative AI model, is uh, is a model that's called um, Claude. So if you would go to Claude.ai, and here I'll put this in the chat, Claude.ai. Oh, that's wrong. Claude. Try more time. Claude.ai. My goodness. Claude.ai. There we go. So this model is, is special. This model you can upload, which is very, very nice. This context length is 100,000 tokens. It's a huge context length. Um, remember the context length for GPT-4 is 8,000. So let's go ahead and, and upload our paper again, get it loaded up there and see if we can start asking questions. So here we're gonna load up this paper. It's going to load this up here. Great. And I'm going to say, I'm going to start a new chat with that uh, paper loaded up. I'm going to say, 
please summarize the paper. And one thing I've noticed over the last couple of weeks as Claude AI has, has gotten more popular is it's slower in responding. Uh, so this one does take a little bit longer. Notice that it did not have that problem with loading the paper. It's loaded the entire paper into its long context length. So it, it, it's, it's gotten even deep into the paper. So flip interaction, having the LLM. Okay, so I'm going to... Flipped interaction is a type of a, of a prompt that you can do. I don't quite understand what it means. So I'm going to say, um, you know, please give me an example of a flipped uh, interaction prompt. Because it has the entire paper in context, it knows the section that has to do with flipped interaction. It has all of the rest of the paper at its disposal. So when it's answering, it's using the full power and the full knowledge of the entire paper in order to respond. Again, as I mentioned, a little bit slower. And here's, a great explanation, possibly better than even what's in the paper itself. From now on, I would like you to ask me questions to deploy Python application to AWS. This is the example, which is in the paper. When you have enough information to deploy the application, create a Python script to automate the deployment. That was uh, modified a little bit. So it, the prompt specifies the overall goal. And the idea is that it asks me questions until it can. it has everything that it has. The model has helped me understand what's going on here. I can ask for another explanation that's more simple. Uh, here, I can, I'm can. i gonna give you an example of something that that uh, that was uh, uh, actually a, a very complex one and, uh, and, it, and it has very sophisticated, oh, I don't have that one loaded, so uh, I'll leave that one out for right now. So I can ask this to explain to me more simply, more complex, give me yet another example. So I'm gonna say, uh, give me an example uh, that I might use uh, in my uh, history of the Roman Empire course. And here I've not told the model anything about me, my background, what I know, what I don't know, but I've given it the context that I want to have it have something to do with history. Oh, this is lovely. Give me three different examples of how the... Uh, so here we go. Would like you to act as a Roman citizen in the first century AD. Ask me a series of questions that will allow you to understand what daily life was like in ancient Rome during this time period. Once you have enough information, write a one-page summary summarizing experiences of Roman, ancient Roman. So the power of the models, even though they're slightly delusional, is that you can give it enough context so you have more and more confidence that the information that you're getting back is going to be trusted. Second, you can ask for any sort of reshaping, recasting, or uh, uh, any type of, of uh, explanation, paraphrasing, analogy, metaphors that work for you. And when they don't work, you can say, I still don't understand, can you explain? And you can go as deep as you need to or ask it to go up as far as you need to. And so long as you're using sufficient context, like I uploaded the entire paper, or you're using tools or plugins, you're likely, you're going to much more likely to get answers that you can trust. So what questions do you have so far about this approach to uh, using the, the, the models directly as individualized tutors?
I, I have a question, but I, I don't want to step on anyone else's toes. So I want to see if anyone else does first. No, you have the floor. So I heard what you were saying that having a lot of context, having a document, using a plugin, these things really make it much more likely to be giving you the correct sort of answer. Yeah. Um, but have you run into hallucinations even when you're doing yeah. all of those things right? Oh, I have not. Um, mm. So it, it makes a big difference. But the fact is that the way that the model is working, you know, is is this way. So even if you are injecting useful information here, it is still the most probable response. So think of it as, as always mitigation. It's strong mitigation, right? Because why on earth would something else be more probable when in the very context that you have now, it has the answer. So it's kind of like that is the most likely because it's I, the answer is right here, <laughs> you know, but it's still probabilistic. Mm -hmm. So that's what's important to keep in mind. That makes sense. Like the average result of a coin flip is edge. But if you were to <laughs> expect that, you would be mistaken. So I can understand how probability can, uh, can mess with this a bit. So the one thing where you can definitely trust uh, if you have sort of complex questions and interactions is when you are using uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, data analytics. So for example, um, uh, so, so here, I uploaded data about uh, about a course, making sure I included no uh, information uh, that was uh, uh, that was a FERPA related uh, information. Uh, let's see if I have. Um, well, this one does not have the graphs here, but because uh, oh, the graphs has gone away, and when it computed the answers for me, I knew I could trust it because it was actually showing me the output of the computations. Uh, that it that it had. So in that case, I could absolutely trust it because what I was looking at was the graphs and the analysis that it had directly computed using the code. And if I had any questions, I could go and analyze the code and see that it was doing exactly what I wanted it to, to do. So this is how you interact directly uh, in in a reliable way uh, to get uh, to get good uh, uh, feedback. And remember, you can. Uh, also do things like, you know, quiz me on uh, derivatives. Uh, I am, and I even misspelled it, but it's going to be able to get it right, just learning calculus. Now it can generate questions for you. And you can do multiple choice questions. And then it can give you, you can you can ask it to not give you the answers. I'm gonna stop the generating here. Uh, you can also ask it to test your knowledge. I think of, uh, ex, uh, of um, acceleration, I'm sorry, as a speed. Yeah, no, acceler, I'm trying to get this wrong. Acceleration, uh, acceleration as the derivative uh, uh, okay, well, as a derivative of speed. Is this right? So, So it has more information. I did not see a call on Wolfram, which is which is interesting. So it's drawing on its own knowledge here, but you can try rephrasing. You can try doing short answers. These are all ways uh, that uh, that you can use it and interact. However, you might suspect that if you could just sort of structure this right, maybe you could actually generate quizzes that you could give to students or students, you could use this to generate things that you could use. And the answer is absolutely you can. 
Dr. Bell is going to be talking now about an application that we've written using exactly these types of capabilities, but providing more structure to make it easier to deploy in a class. All right, thank you so much for that. I am excited to talk about our uh, software that we have developed to help students engage in self-study and help instructors understand what is not clear or clear um, based on the self-study done by their students. Uh, so we have created a repo, so a GitHub repository. That means it's some, some a place where we keep all of our code. So let me share that. So I think I've shared the correct window here. So this is our, our repository called LO Achievement. Um, again, it is a suite um, of tools for classroom learning and assessment. Um, what it is, is that it has actually a set of tools. It's called a suite and it's meant for both instructors and for students. Um, for students, it's really focused towards the self-study. Uh, so we have some uh, Google Colab notebooks that you'll see here. And these allow students to direct, uh, to interact programmatically um, and actually customize the way that they want to interact uh, with the model. We also have instructor notebooks. The instructor notebooks are really focused on being able to understand what their classes are doing. So let's say that you know your class, every single person in there engages in the self-study and maybe they submit it to Brightspace as part of an assignment. What you can do is download all of those self-studies um, into a zip file and put them into this Google Colab notebook, which will evaluate also using models, how your entire class is doing, but also evaluate each student individually. Um, and our next version of the software will also be able to hopefully be able to directly upload those scores to Brightspace and give you an overview of what students understand really well and what they don't understand. So we have two, we have a variety of ways, as I was saying before, of interacting um, with the model. So one, we have these um, just directly written uh, prompts that will help students um, to uh, write or maybe just create copy and paste prompts if they wanna use something like the Claude AI that we just saw, or they wanna use OpenAI's chat interface. Uh, they can use directly these um, prompts that we've created that will help them to get the desired behavior that they want. As you saw before, we also have the Google Colab notebooks, which allows a little bit more customization, but then we also have a user interface. And I'm going to show you a bit of that right now. The main focus, again, of the user interface, this one is targeted towards students, but in a way, we're all students. Um, so we can all use this for self-study. So let me share that one. And here we have our friend, the slightly delusional tutor. Um, so uh, this is a user interface that we have come up with um, to help students in their self-study. Uh, it has a variety of components that I'll go through here, but uh, one thing that you will need is a OpenAI API key. Uh, that basically allows you to uh, access OpenAI models. So we're talking chat GPT, GPT-4 um, programmatically. So that's something that you will need. Um, I had saved these. Okay, let's just open this. All right. Oh, and it's being, of course, obtuse in this particular moment. That's okay. We'll come back to that as a quick fix. And I'll just give you an uh, overview of all the things that we're looking at. So here we have our OpenAI key that we input. Um, of course, when we're trying to study, usually we're trying to study something, right? So Jesse, Jesse was telling us about the paper that he used in his class. That is something that students would want to study. So in that case, we provide this interface to directly upload a PDF file um, or a text file. Uh, in the next implementation, we will also have a number of other mechanisms that one can use. So for example, um, people, it'll be possible to use YouTube videos um, or use just directly the transcripts, 
or and and other types of, of interfaces like that. Oh, and also web scraping, not scraping, but web uh, usage of the web page. So here, let me just put my API key in. You see that it's pretty long there. Um, and now we're gonna add our reference documents. Again, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna upload a PDF. Um, this particular approach is really good when you have long documents. If you have something super short, straightforward to the point, um, you can also copy and paste the text um, as well here. So we're gonna go ahead and add something. Oh. We are going to use one of our favorites that we've been demoing with, uh, Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. And as you can see here, it is just the poem. So you can see that we uploaded that. And now we might choose to enter some learning objectives. So learning objectives are really nice because they help to target the uh, model towards what you, the instructor, want your students to learn. Um, it's not really required to put this in here, but I'm gonna go ahead and add this. So the learning objectives might be to uh, understand uh, the metaphorical implications um, of the text. So then we have all of the information that we need to get started and we're gonna start studying with our tutor. So we're gonna go ahead and click this. You can see here, it takes a little second to think it's setting up right then your documents um, and it's also initializing your tutor. And so now this is initialized. So now we come to the section that is generate a pre-made prompt. So this section also is completely not necessary but it's really helpful for learners who are just starting with prompting. Um, so I'm gonna show you an example. So here, let's say that you wanna go into this quizzing. Um, it is really nice when you have a tutor that can uh, quiz you and give you feedback. Um, and then there's lots of different ways that we can ask questions. So let's say, for example, we start with short answer. You see that we have a lot of different ways of, of, of asking questions. So maybe someone might like multiple choice or maybe there's a true false moment. Uh, we have the capability to do any of those things here and we will add more in the next update. I do love a short answer, so let's do that one. Uh, then we'll in, uh, input a desired number, number of questions. So maybe we want a long quiz, maybe we want a short quiz. Um, this is just something that is helpful uh, as students are beginning um, to interact with models. In here, maybe we just wanna specify how long our answers are gonna be. So for example, we might have one to two students or one to two sentences. So when we have these settings, what we can do is actually go ahead and generate that prompt. So here, this is a total prompt that we can use. So this has already been created. Um, and so that contains the prompting that we like to use um, to help the model enter in a way that we like. So in, in a high fidelity way that it actually follows the instructions. As we said, this model is a little bit delusional, but uh, it, we, it, it can be uh, on point the more context and instruction that we give it. So now we might come down to chat with the model. This is the entirety of the interaction with the model now. Before we were just setting up uh, the, the large language model and setting up our prompts. Um, you can see down here that what we have is actually already like the prompt input. Uh, but I'm just gonna erase that because I like to write my own prompts sometimes. Um, something that's also really, really helpful um, that we implemented is this topic or concept. Um, when you have a really large document, um, sometimes it helps if when you're looking at the places in the document that are important, if you have a particular sentence or a particular focus um, of the areas of that document that you want to retrieve. So maybe the topic that I would put for the road not taking, taken is the metaphorical, again, um, uh, metaphorical, let's see, impl implications of the road not taken. So that's, that's what I want to know. I want to understand better the metaphors. And then again, what we're doing this is based on the road not taken text that we just had. So now I'm gonna insert my question. Let's see, let's see what it prompt. Uh, ask me questions about the road not taken so I can better understand the metaphorical applications. Um, ask me, see, let's pull that up. Questions one at a time and then critique my answer 
happy. Then ask me again. And this is, oops. So this doesn't have to be exactly correct, but I'm going to fix it just because I'm looking at it. Um, and so this is the a lot of the components that we have in that earlier prompt that we uh, generated. Um, but this is just kind of a consolidated version of that. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to start talking with the model. It may take a little bit of a second, and maybe I'll make this a little bit smaller so we get to see a little bit more of this. So here you see my question. Right now it's thinking, and this is what it says back to me. Um, they want... It says that it wants to help me master the topics and it gives me the first question. What is the significance of the two roads diverging in the wood? Um, provide your answer and I will provide feedback. And so here we see that it actually is following uh, the instructions that we gave. We wanted to better understand metaphorical applications in the road not taken. And so it was asking us about the significance of the roads diverging in the wood. So let's see, um, anyone want to answer it? I can take answers from the chat um, or you can just unmute. Oh, no one's feeling brave. Hey, take the road not taken. I'm writing, I'm writing. Okay, okay. <laughs> let's get on that road not taken. All right, and while we are looking at answers uh, in the chat and while you're generating those, I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about this um, part over here. So this part of the user interface, you see that it says reference, sor reference sources, okay? So right now it is just looking at something very specific, which is just this little piece um, of the document to try to generate these questions. Um, and so this is the backing, essentially, of how it's generating these questions and also what it's thinking about when it generates its responses. So thank you, Noah. Um, I'm going to grab, just copy and paste this, and I'm going to answer our model. So what is the significance? Roads represent choices you can make in your life. The one more taken is safer and easier, but also has less potential for unknown benefits. Beautiful. What a great answer. So I'll tell it that. Let's see what it says. It's uh, thinking, evaluating. So right now it is uh, sending this whole conversation with our, our most recent answer to OpenAI. And we are now getting our answer back. So here we see that the feedback, oh, all right, it says that our answer is partially correct. Um, the, the, the roads do represent choices in life. However, um, it's saying that this is not explicitly sta st stated, which is interesting because we're trying to understand metaphors. Um, interesting because now we're having our slightly delusional um, moment, but this is essentially what it's trying to say is choosing a less conventional path can you lead to unique experiences and outcomes, even though that's kind of similar to what was already said. Um, but luckily we have the ability to read these things and that helps us. So now we wanna move on to the next question and it provides us another question. What does the phrase, and that has made all the difference imply in the context of the poem? So I will go ahead and just, I don't know, give an answer. And I'm gonna try to answer just completely incorrectly um, in the context of poem. It means that always choosing the safe route is the best way. Um, nothing makes any difference. Just pick a way. All right, let's see what it thinks about that. And so we can go on along. Um, it will answer. We can just see what it'll say. Uh, let's see. <laughs> it says this interpretation does not align with the message of the poem. It actually implies that the speaker's choice is to take the road less traveled and it had a significant impact on their life. And so we can see the rest of its answer. So it corrected me and it helped me to better understand. So I would have more and more of these conversations with the model, um, asking it questions and it answering. 
And then maybe if if this is a moment where we want to submit this um, to Brightspace for our instructor to review, uh, we're able to uh, export this chat history. So for example, I can put it in JSON. JSON is the default um, mechanism that we have for the instructor evaluation notebook. So I can go ahead and output that. It says it's just named by default tutoring conversation. Here, this is where we download. So now we can download this. Um, let's put it somewhere. Let's put it back in here. Great. And now we can take a look at that. Let me open it. And I guess share that screen as well. Is it the most beautifully formatted? No, but it doesn't actually have to be all that beautifully formatted because it is the JSON format. Um, so let me show you that one. So here we see it is not the most beautiful thing that we've ever seen in our lives. But what we do see is that it has the beginning and all of the questions. It has what the user has said. It says what the chatbot has says, and it has the entire history of the conversation. Now at this moment, we can upload this to Brightspace and our instructor can go and use the user interface in order to evaluate um, how the classes are doing. So this is just one way we have implemented. Um, another component of what we have is the uh, oral exam module. So it is very similar like similar to this, but it assists um, with generating questions for presentations, um, doing an oral exam. So these same sorts of questions, but orally. Um, also enabling further accessibility for maybe people who cannot, who are not typing as much. Um, and also it just allows a more conversational tone to learn how to answer uh, under pressure when you have to say something. Um, so these are the major uh, components of where we are with our class suite. Um, if you have uh, any uh, suggestions or anything that you'd like to see, we would love to get those suggestions. Um, and also, uh, you are also able to develop this further once we get this uh, released open source. I'd like to thank you all very much for, for attending our workshop. Appreciate all the questions in the in the comments. We'll have a recording of this available, and uh, we'll have a link to the uh, to the presentation as well uh, uh, up on our YouTube channel. Probably be a few days before it gets up there. But thank you all very much. Have a good day. Thank you.